Welcome to this oral history interview. It is a part of a developing series of interviews focusing on African American experiences on Route 66 centered around Greene County, Missouri. My name is Samuel Knox, Managing Editor of the Unite Publication. This series is supported in part by a grant from the Route 66 Corridor Preservation Program of the National Park Service. Today's date is Thursday, May 14, 2015. My special guest today is Clarence Brewer. Clarence is a gifted metal sculptor and an international blues musician, singer, and songwriter. Clarence, welcome, and thank you for being our guest. Thank you, Sam. How are you? I'm doing fine, thank you. Clarence, let's start off by uh, uh, the first question. Where and when were you born? I was born at the Hanley Memorial Hospital on the corner of Tampa and uh, Benton Street in 1949 in Springfield, Missouri. Um, it was May the 24th, big thunderstorm, uh -huh. from what I heard. But uh, yeah, that was when I was born. Um, it was still a segregated town and uh, was so until I was, probably still is, but you know, that's another story. But yeah, May 24th, 1949, I'm, I'll be 66 on the 24th of this month, 10 days from now. Okay. Uh, who are your parents and uh, what type of work did they do? My father, Nathan Ferguson Brewer, uh, was a, he had his own trucking company and he hauled trash and did a lot of recycling and in later years, he began to work at Hickory Hills Country Club, and then he went from Hickory Hills Country Club as a night janitor to the head of the janitor staff at City Utilities. So he worked there for 25 years, and he retired from City Utilities. Um, and my mother was um, a, um, gosh, my mom was a giant of a person. First of all, she'd be upset if I didn't say that she was an artist in her own right. She was really a crafty person. And uh, she was, above all things else, a Christian woman. She was first before everything. And she worked um, at the Landers Building, cleaning offices, and later on she worked at the country club as well in the women's lounge and uh, she was like a matron down there and then she worked at the Dayton Rubber Company Deco for um, the rest of her working life which was pretty much 25 years or so she retired from Dayton Rubber Company it's poison to her a lot of people who work industrial jobs like that wound up, you know, having disabilities. And she had a, a bad kidney anyway, and, and it just kind of worked hard on her. But those were the places that she worked until she retired. And uh, um, they st stood by us kids. I have four siblings, um, a brother and three sisters, and they managed to get three of us through college Three, yeah, three of us through college. And uh, my baby sister has been the vice president of uh, Buena Vista Television for the last 40 years, I guess. That's Walt Disney Television. So, um, and she's largely responsible for the Disney cartoons that uh, were second generation for satellite and cable. <clears throat> she managed the satellite out of Pittsburgh and when Westinghouse decided that they didn't want to be in the broadcast business but more like in the technological end of the thing they sold that satellite to uh, Walt Disney and that's where the Walt Disney networks all come from now is that old satellite that they put up back in you know 1984 85 something like that but they called her in because she was programming the satellite for Westinghouse. First she got a job at Howard University and then she moved to Westinghouse 
and then from Westinghouse to Los Angeles, and she's been out there. Laureen, my sister, she's mother of five. She has moved back to Springfield. I think she lives over on Portland Street now. Okay. And so my mom and dad, the best people in the world. I, I came back from California where I had been living for five or six years. And I saw that they had entered geriatry. They had started into decline back in 83 or so, 1983. And so I elected to come here. I don't have any children and I wasn't married. Uh, and so that was that. I just had to come and start helping them. Um, Dad just wouldn't admit that he was getting old, <laughs> kind of like me. <laughs> but uh, my mom, was real plaintive. She said, uh, if you don't help us, your father's just gonna run into something with that old truck and we'll lose everything. And I said, okay, I'll help. So that's how I wound up back in Springfield. And it's okay, I like it enough. I knew, you know, it was an easy, easy enough town to work because I grew up here. My grandfather dug the basement for Campbell School back in 1930, I think it was. Then he dug the basement for Jarrett Junior High School in 33, I think. And um, he dug the basement and foundation for the federal penitentiary right after that, all by himself with two little horses. Well, one big horse and one little horse and a slip. And uh, um, used the money to buy my little farm out on Wilson Creek. I have five acres on the bank of Wilson Creek. But it's getting to where housing developments, subdivisions are being moved in all around. And it's zoned agricultural, but I don't know if I'll ever be able to see it to an agricultural, and maybe a community garden or something like that. I've been mowing the place for the last 30 years, so, you know, since I was four. <laughs> uh, t tell me about uh, what it was like growing up in Springfield. What school did you go to? Well, curiously, I went to Campbell School, my first, my first school. I'd gone over, Lincoln had a little babysitting program that every now and then, if your younger brother or sister was going to be left at home, you could go to Lincoln School with your older siblings and that would be okay, you know? And I would go every now and then, but as far as like my formal first grade, it started at Campbell School in 1956. And that was two years after Brown versus Topeka. Well, Mr. Gilmore, who was the janitor, took me to show me the excavation work that my grandfather had done in the basement of the school for the boilers and the different things. And he goes, this is an excellent job. And your grandfather did it. And it didn't mean much, you know, but the walls were all real straight and it was a really, you know, nice space down there, you know, lots of storage and stuff like that. And then whenever I had talked to my grandpa who died in, I think uh, he died in 68. But um, he told me about how he had uh, been doing gardens. He, he was a plowman and he would plow gardens for people because a lot of people had gardens back in the 30s. And so um, they, Mr., I think it was Roundtree, whoever the superintendent was then, it was one of those guys, I believe it was Roundtree. But he asked uh, my grandpa if he would excavate for that Campbell. And then after he'd done such a good job, they said, well, will you excavate for Jared, the middle school? And so he did that. And then whenever it came time to do the federal penitentiary, well, they, he was the go-to guy. So he'd done those three, but I gotta tell you, teaming a horse to do excavation is brutal work. It's very, very, very hard. I plowed uh, two acres with a horse once, Mr. Ross Cook had a horse and he plowed gardens too. And so we had 15 acres that we were working. And so here, Clarence, you try it. And oh my, 
stars. It was so hard, you know, and really the horse did a lot, but those old bottom plows, you'd have to really get them out of the ground and get them in the ground and move that around. And hopefully the horse would do the work, most of the work for you, but you had to be big enough to do it. And I was just a baby midget until I was like almost 19 or 20. And then I kind of shot up a little bit, didn't know like that, but yeah, so Campbell was the first school and uh, um, I went through that. And then Jarrett was my second school. So my grandpa did the basement for the first two schools that I went to. And uh, then I went from Jarrett to Parkview and then from Parkview I went to then SMS. I started in industrial technology because I shown that I had this artistic ability to weld and um, um, so they said well you're college material so I went in in industrial education that was not very smart because ultimately I wound up in the art department anyway and um, from there I got a degree in photography and um, I had my first stage solo in 1969 at the Tent Theater. Um, I could always sing and I knew my way around music enough to be entertaining anyway. I don't know if I, you know, I hope. But um, my experiences in the Holiness Church, um, Timmons Temple over there, I was. My mother was a churchwoman over there uh, during my gestation and for the first 13 years of my life I was attending Timmons Temple and uh, the music in the Holiness Church, the Pentecostal Church was in my opinion vastly superior to the music in all the other churches because it was open to rhythm sections and, and organs and everybody sang and everybody, you know, felt the Holy Spirit. And so there was a, a great deal of music delivered to me from the church. And in some ways I was sort of sad to leave the Holiness Church, but Reverend Brown came to town. Oliver Brown, who had won Brown versus Topeka, and he was minister at the Washington Avenue Church, and so he was a rock star. So a lot of churches lost their congregations to this one famous preacher. And uh, my, my strongest memory, and this may still affect me today, of that church was, well, I was, 11 whenever he came to town in 1960 and um, so I did a lot of sleeping in Sunday school and I remember once uh, you know I heard my name being talked about but it was just I was really trying to rally wake up you know to hear what it was and the next thing I know I got my sister's elbow saying yes you're going to do it say yes you'll do it and I goes do what and she goes the Tom Thumb wedding and I said Tom Thumb Wedding, what's that? And she goes, doesn't matter, just say you're gonna do it. So they go, I said, yes, I'll do it. And so Gwendolyn was my next door neighbor, and Miss Kane, who was the head of the Sunday school, goes, oh great, Clarence is marrying Rudy. Cheryl Brown, that was her nickname. Reverend Brown had three daughters, Cheryl, Rudy, and Linda. Linda was the one that the case was brought on. Uh, Terry, was the middle one and Rudy was the one that was my age maybe a year younger or so they were absolutely beautiful girls they were just and really sweet nice people I haven't seen them hardly since I haven't seen them at all since but I said yes I'll do it and so then I heard I was supposed to you know have this full marriage with her so a lot of people don't know what a Tom Thumb wedding is you probably do but there was a carnival guy named Tom Thumb with Barman Bailey Circus and he was having a wild affair with Thumbelina who was the smallest person on earth so here you have these two little people and 
uh, Barnum was told, if you let them keep doing what they do, because they were really hardcore carnies, they smoked, they drank, they fornicated in public, and they were just the mess, this big a mess, you know? And so they said, you're gonna get in trouble for that. So he said, okay, well, we'll marry them. So we put up a poster, Tom Thumb to marry Thumbelina. 5,000 people showed up. <laughs> and so the wheels started turning. So they married at every whistle stop across the country. Well, the church women decided we should do this to raise some money. And that was exactly what was happening, except for Rudy had developed a, an admirer, a guy with a crush who was probably about your size and 14 years old. And whenever he heard that we were going to be married in this Tom Bum wedding, being kind of fresh from Mississippi and first one thing and another, he processed it like it was the real deal. So when Miss Kane said, Clarence, go back down there and get my hymnal, he came from behind the door and jumped on me and grabbed my hair. I looked like a little little Richard back then. I had a big pompadour. Mom would always, you know, curl up my hair and send me off to church all clean and stuff. Well, he jumped on me and beat my head against the concrete until I passed out. And all the time he was going, Rudy don't love you, Rudy love me. <laughs> bip, 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 bip. So there I was, you know, 87 pounds, and he was like 230 or 40, you know, just knocked me out. <clears throat> I woke up, it was like Dorothy from Oz, you know, there was, you were there, and you were there, no, you were there too. Reverend Brown parted the water. He said, oh my gosh, look at that hematoma. I go, where? He goes, and so then my brother said, that knot on your head, you're gonna get a whipping for fighting in church. <laughs> oh no, a whipping for fighting in church. Knot on my, and so I couldn't get my hand to my head because there was a big knot on it. So Reverend Brown said, well, we're gonna have to take you home, young man, uh, you know, blah, 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 blah. So, boy, that was my chance to grill Reverend Brown, you know. So I began to ask him questions, you know. I said, now, did you go up there to the Supreme Court? I saw it on TV. And I said, now, those, do they make, do they make justice up there? Now, what do they make that out of, anyway? And those guys in the black coats, are they, like, against the guys in the white robes, you know, the Klan and the justices as like teams, and those are like their uniforms. He's, no, 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 you, you're asking a lot of questions. Young man, you're going to have more trouble with the members of your own race than you are white people. Now, just, uh, you know, uh, let me talk to your mother about this, and uh, uh, we'll see if uh, you're going to be in the Tom Thumb wedding. I'm going, what is a Tom Thumb wedding, you know? Cause I, so, you know, I got to home. He was driving the big Buick. And mom was on the porch opening the door whenever I put one foot on the front step. And she looked at the knot and the clothes all ripped up. And she goes, she, had, she was fried chicken. I never will forget. She had a spatula. She says, oh, you're going to get a whipping for fighting in church. <laughs> I go, oh, no. I'm, uh, I couldn't say anything. And Reverend Brown was like, you know, a lawyer button in his coat and oh no this brewer Clarence is the best in the Sunday school he will eat just Tom Thumb wedding she goes oh Tom Thumb wedding so I looked up in the you know later I found out what it was but I just blanked out that June because between that April and that June a few things happened a lot of things happen when you're a child and one of the things that happened was I got my first guitar from Ike Martin Music down there. And mom had traded a $500 accordion that my sister had begged her to get. It was an Italian thing. And uh, my other little sister wouldn't let me play her piano, you know, because I would, so I'd go over next door to Mr. O'Neill and play Sea Cruise and sing and stuff like that, you know, because he had a piano I could play, and Albert, and, and Virgil and Gwendolyn were always let, showing me little moves on piano, stuff like that. So I got this guitar down at Ike Martin's Music um, because she found out that, that I had been assaulted in the 
after the whipping, of course, she found out that I was the victim and not, you know, really in there scrapping at the church. So uh, I think that she felt kind of like, oh, well, I'll get him any musical instrument he wants, except drums. <laughs> and, and that was kind of curious because Dave Bedell's my cousin, and I would have been able to learn drumming from him. But she goes, what instrument do you want? I said, okay, I guess a guitar or something. So we went down there and there was this guy, I think his name was Frank, and he was, it was eight o'clock in the morning Saturday, and she had the, me and the accordion in tow. She goes in, and Frank goes, what do you want here? And so he goes, well, my son wants a guitar. She goes, well, these are real expensive. I don't know if you guys can afford this. And so she goes, well, how much are they? He goes, $100. She says, $100? And those were like really the worst guitars in the world. But, <laughs> She goes, well, I've, I've got this accordion. They cost her 500 bucks. Can I trade and get something? He goes, yeah, but it'll cost you 20 more bucks. So he reached up and he got the worst guitar that he could. And he handed it to mom. And, and so I'm trying to touch it. She says, don't you touch it, you'll break it. <laughs> and so she goes, you know, and it looked like it was falling apart. Well, this is new though. So uh, it, she, just hated to see that accordion leave her because they, you know, Lawrence Welk and everything, it was like the big deal in the 50s. But when rock and roll hit, it was the guitar. It supplanted the accordion as the front instrument. And, you know, polka music, black kids, just, it wasn't a bad, it didn't fit, you know. So I had this guitar. And I was trying to look at it, and she's trying to keep me from touching it because I'd break it, you know, and it was already just, I, if I'd known about what I knew about guitars now, you know, I'd walked out. But she looked around, and there were a bunch of old crusty signs, and one said, um, lessons for every instrument that you buy. So she goes, that sign says that you'll teach him how to play this. And he hadn't looked at the sign in years and was kind of upset that she saw it. You know, <laughs> says, okay, there'll be a teacher here next week. Bring him back. So the next week I come back, it's 11 o'clock in the daytime. And down on Campbell Street at that time, there was bars, 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 clothing store, bar, 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 furniture store, bar, 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 bar. And it was that way all the way to Commercial Street. You know, now up in north of Campbell Street, there was a church and, you know, some rundown houses and stuff. And this is right before. Simply if God hit up there and bought up all that part of Commercial Street, uh, not, I mean, Campbell Street up there. Well, um, all of these alcoholics were in Ike Martins. On Ike Martins, one side was guns, the other side was guitars, and in the middle were stuffed animals. And these guys are all sitting around Frank, and Frank is up there doing his nails. He looks like a big rat with Italian shoes and socks on. And, and they're all barking, yeah, when that Martin Luther Coon comes to town, we're gonna get him just like we got them others. And they all look at me, like, and I'm standing there with the box and the guitar, and, you know, and yeah, we're gonna get him. And they're drinking and crowing and carrying on, you know, and I'm going, you know, I've heard drinking and crowing and carrying on. So uh, I eased up and I said, Is, do I get a lesson or what? And he goes, Carl's upstairs. And so I go upstairs and, from before I even get to this guy going, <laughs> sounds horrible, it's like he's dying in there. So I open the door and I go in, and he goes, what do you know? And I go, nothing, what do you know? And he goes, no, on the guitar. And I go, I, I, I don't know nothing. He goes, well, let me see your instrument. So I opened it up and he goes, where'd you get this piece of crap? And I go, from Frank downstairs. And he goes, well, that, that, I cannot believe it. I said, Mom traded a, a guitar, a, a, traded an accordion for it, and she gave him $20. He goes, that's not a bit. Oh, come on. <laughs> so he put the guitar back in the box. Frank wouldn't let me ride the elevator up, but we got to ride the elevator down. So we went, he went right up to him, and he was an old skinny guy, white-faced, you know, with a beard and, you know, and coughing blood up and stuff. And so he went up to Frank, and he goes, now, what the hell are you doing? Why did you sell him this? this? I can't teach these kids how to play guitar if you don't sell them a good instrument. And he goes, now you listen to me, you old son of a bitch. 
So Carl got a Bell Bay book, handed it to me. Frank goes, that's 50 cents. So Carl goes, I'm taking care of it. Clarence, go home, come back next week. So I come back the next week, same thing. Well, why are we could have made that? We ain't getting you know, Whoever's writing to these guys is not very good. So it's like over and over again, the same thing. So I go uh, up and I said, uh, is Carl here? He goes, Carl died. <laughs> and he said it like he killed him, you know. <laughs> You know, I said, Carl died. Ooh. So I went out, Mama was driving up the street, and she saw me out in front of a bar with a guitar. She says, what are you doing? You're supposed to be out in the guitar lesson. I said, Carl died. And she goes, he did? Did your dad know that? I have an uncle named Carl. She thought I was saying Uncle Carl died. And I go, no. She said, well, who told you? And I said, Frank. And she said, I said, Carl, my, my guitar teacher. She said, get in the car. So we went down there, and she goes, now you look here. She said some expletives. You said you would teach him how to play the guitar. If you don't, I'm going to go up there to Glenn Hendricks, and I'm going to bring him down here, and I'm going to get that accordion, and my $20 back, and I'm going to go up to him for music, and they'll teach him how to play the guitar. He goes, okay, Miss Brewer, that's all right. We'll have another guitar teacher here next week. Next week, it's Ricky Schott. And Ricky has got like love and hate tattooed on his fingers. Right here, his knuckles. He's got two packs of cigarettes rolled up in his sleeves and his t shirt. He's got a switchblade comb, one of the first ones I've ever seen. You know, click. And he's combing his hair back like kooky burns. And, you know, he's got chuckle boots on, a chain for a belt. So I walk in. I knock on the door and nothing. Knock again. Who is it? And I go, It's me, Clarence. I'm trying to have a guitar lesson. He opens the door, pulls me in. He goes, Anybody follow you up here? And I go, nobody follows me, I'm 11. He goes, what are you here for? And I said, a guitar lesson. He says, is that your guitar? And I go, yeah. So I said, hey, where did you get this thing? This is a horrible guitar. And I go, Frank, downstairs. And he goes, yeah, it's figures. So he goes, you know anything? And I go, no, I don't know anything. He goes, do you know any Link Ray? And I go, like Rumble on the radio? Can I see that? And I, he goes, yeah, Rumble. You know how to play Rumble? And I go, no. And he goes, well, here's how you play it. So he played the whole album on the guitar, and it sounded horrible, but he could play it, you know, so I'm pretty sure it could work. So I left. He said, learn that and come back next week. So as I started to learn rumble, I figured, I found that if I flipped my collar up and put on sunglasses and wrote love and hate on my fingernails, that it, on my you know, phone, I could play like Ricky, you know. So I did that, and I was trying to play rumble. I got it down to where it's a little three chord, four chord tune. Got it down, went back in. I was gonna go play rumble for Ricky, you know, that's the that thing. So I go in, and there's the, you know, cattle call crew. So I just walked right up to Frank. I said, is Ricky here? And he goes, Ricky's in jail. <laughs> so I quick walked out. Mama was driving up the street and she goes, where are you going? You're supposed to be having a guitar lesson. I said, Rick's in jail. She goes, you're going to have to learn how to play that guitar yourself. Your father is always going to be trying to get me to do these things for you kids. And just went on and on and on and on and all the way. So she took me home and dropped me off. Mr. O'Neill, next door neighbor, looks across the fence and says, Clarence, what are you doing with that thing? And he was a guitar player. He could play pretty good. And I saw trying to learn how to have the book between my legs and trying to play chords. And so he goes, well, who are you trying to play like? I said, I don't know, Bo Diddley or Chuck Berry, somebody like that, you know? He goes, oh, you want to play blues? And I go, yeah, I guess, I don't know. He goes, where's your mama at? And I go, Safeway. He goes, well, I'm going to show you something. I'll show you how to play a little blues chord. But don't you tell your mama I showed you how to do this. So I said, okay. So he showed me an A7 chord, you know? He goes, now you hear blues in that? It's pretty easy to manipulate. I go, yeah, yeah, I can hear blues in that. He goes, okay, here's an E7 chord, and here's a B7 chord. So he says, now you hear the blues and all that? Well, it was the seventh chord that makes it sound a little bluesy. But I go, yeah, it sounds good. He goes, well, just practice the A7. He heard mama drive in the driveway. He goes, I gotta go. Don't tell her I showed you how to do this. So he took off. So I'm sitting there playing the A7 chord. Dee, 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 dee. You know, I, you know, 
I, I learned, of course, I hadn't made the changes yet. So mom came up, she goes, what are you doing? I said, I'm learning how to play guitar, like you just told me. She says, where did you learn how to play that? Like you're playing right there. I go, Mr. O'Neill showed me. <laughs> I knew I was gonna be a musician then because I just gave him right up, you know, just rolled over on him. And she goes, hmm, you need to be washing the dishes, cleaning up that room and mowing this grass. Oh, okay, so every time I pick up the guitar after that, I'd have chores to do before I could play the guitar. So, three days later, mom's out uh, on the back porch washing. Mr. O'Neill comes out to feed Coyote, his dog, and I heard his door shut. And then about three seconds later, I heard our door shut on the back porch. So I ran up to the window and looked out. She goes, Clayman, I need to talk to you. So I'm looking out the window. She goes, our young Negro men are going to have trouble enough without playing this old boogly oogly music that you're teaching him. Now Clarence is very impressionable and I want you to not let him come over here and be playing sea cruise on the piano because everybody in the neighborhood hears him and I just don't think that's the direction that I want him to go with music. Yes, Miss Brewer. Yes, Miss Brewer. <laughs> and another thing. Um, you know, uh, Virgil and, and uh, Gwendolyn and, and uh, the rest of them seem to think that, uh, they, that he's going to be playing music and they are the ones who have been bringing him over here. Now, I, I, Virgil is okay, but Gwendolyn and, and, and Albert, you know, I, I wish you would just not let them bring him over here for the piano. Yes, Miss Brewer, yes, Miss Brewer. <laughs> so that was it, you know, I was just like, eh. <laughs> that was the end of music until I got to college. And then in college, a bunch of the other white guys with good guitars said, here's how you play the guitar, and here's how it works. This is a good instrument, a Fender. So my friend John Barnes got me a Gretsch, a Duo Jet, and uh, I learned all my chords and started writing little bits of songs and stuff like that in college. And, um, then I graduated from college in 72. I had had a solo in the 10th theater. They had a Chautauqua show. So I went up there and I, I sang Old Man River, but being only like, you know, five feet two at that time, they dressed me in a big hat and I had a huge afro. You couldn't even see my face when they put the, <laughs> it was, and they put me in a big old coat. I was one of the drunkards in, the drunkard, <laughs> you know, there's the drunkard, the main drunkard, that was Brian Hudspeth. But um, I could sing, and at night I, would, I was making costumes in the theater that had already run. I'd won the Best Actor Award in College Theater in 1969 from a one act called Sarah and the Sax. It was about a Jewish woman in Central Park and this jazz saxophone player we got Bill Jones to go backstage because I couldn't take up the sax and learn it all. But I would ape Bill's moves right behind the wings. And uh, uh, it was a tearjerker. Both people had lost all of their relatives and they were alone. And that was their correlate, that they were alone and they were vying over this one bench in a sunny spot in uh, Central Park. That was the message of the thing. And they had you know, a sort of a catharsis at the end where they, you know, fell in with each other. Sarah and the Sax, I think it was Louis John Carlino. Well, that was early in 69. Then Dr. Covert picked me up because I could do film and I made film for them. Then later in 69, I'm in the tent and I have this solo and I'm doing my solo and uh, it's just a great thing. I had a great booming voice and, they didn't expect it out of a little bitty guy. And Dr. Gilmore kind of set me up for it. It was, it was really a lot of fun. Um, and then I grad, and then I took off with the girl from the box office and went to San Francisco because her roommate had already moved to San Francisco and I had a big crush on her. Her name was Jackie Fishman. She was a Jewish girl. And uh, we still keep in touch some these days, but got to San Francisco and boy, that was an eye opener. That town was different from Springfield quite a bit, you know. I mean, I just went there because they were there. 
I got a few little jobs around there, but um, by the, I, I think I worked as an artist for KNEW TV in San Francisco. And then they sold their shop to KQED. My friend Tim McDonald was the guy who got me in, and he was the station manager. He'd sold me all of his equipment, his photo photographic equipment, because all through 69, I was driving all over town, and there was an E4 um, ectochrome process that you could do you know, in your bathroom. You load up the tanks with slides and you make them. Well, I'd go off all the car lots, and I would get $7 a slide to take them to the television station. So I would do four or five tanks of slides and, you know, make a couple hundred bucks, you know, uh, by delivering, go to the car lots. And that was before video and stuff really had its revolution. So the guy that sold me that was working in San Francisco. So he put me on and two, like a month later, KQED just bought the whole thing, you know, bought all of KNEW's, Metro Media's station house. I was out of a job and I was halfway through college. So I came back to finish up my degree. I finished the degree, went back to San Francisco, finished the degree in photography because I had already been invested in. I fell off a mountain on the way back from San Francisco. It blew me around the Sandia Canyon for 15, 20 minutes and then deposited me on the rock. It's was, it was like base jumping, but not falling because I was so light and my afro was so big that it just kept me floating around in the air with this camera. And so I looked at this camera and I was trying to take a scenic picture and uh, the wind just picked me up. And so Chuck Wellman, who had to move away, he was my photography teacher. He was living in Albuquerque. He says Linda Moreno was his wife and she was, they were up there with me to sightsee and take pictures. But when the wind blew me off the mountain, you know, they ducked and went back and got the ranger. And so I was just floating around out there because every day the wind comes up that side of the mountain at 140, 150 miles an hour. They rescued me and said, look, uh, the ranger was real mad. He says, you see that sign? He said, the high wind, 458. And I go, what does that mean? He goes, well, 37 people have died because there's high wind at four, we, we change it four minutes every day. Forward in the summer and then from the middle of the summer they go backwards because the sun heats the desert and pushes the wind and it starts to climb. And so heat rising, you know, wind anyway, it's 100, 140 miles an hour. It's an amazing phenomenon. But I survived that, got back here, finished my degree in photography, and then went back to San Francisco, where I just almost immediately got into a job, a movie with Sun Ra, the jazz musician. It's called Space is the Place, and I was the guy that stunt drove the 50 Studebaker and rescued him from the warehouse where the spies had him. Went on through that. The movie's a cult classic, it's still around, it's all over YouTube. Space is the place. And I got to talk with Sun Ra, and Ra was really a great mentor. He was just the best mentor you could have about music because he'd been around for so long, you know, even at that time. So I finished that movie and uh, um, stayed on, worked for a guy that had a show that toured the, the Bay Area, and another guy who did light shows. Pat Furlong, he was from Ireland. He was, like had these curious ties with the IRA. <laughs> I, you know, I would go down to his shop uh, uh, and uh, there'd be all these Irish toughs around, you know, because he was a great engineer and they wanted him to make bombs. But he was really into show lights. <laughs> That's what his whole thing was. And he was in the process of saying, look, I'm not gonna do this for you guys. I don't do this anymore, I never did it. But, you know, the thing was is that um, I worked for him, and then after some certain point, because of my vegetarian diet and my, you know, sense of moral, whatever it was, I 
decided that I was going to die if I stayed in San Francisco. So I moved back to Springfield. Springfield, San Francisco, Springfield, San Francisco. That's the only thing in my life. It was back and forth. I don't even know why. But I got a job. I was down at, I had a girlfriend and she had a job at Silver Dollar City. And um, so we, there were, at first there were four of us living in Reed Spring and driving to Silver Dollar City. <clears throat> and so uh, they sent me to the grocery store and I'm at the country market on 76 Highway. And I'm waiting in line and I hear behind me, Clarence Brewer. I go, uh oh. So I turn around and it's Shad Heller. And he's like the mayor of Silver Dollar City. He goes, let me shake your hand. He goes, what are you doing? And I go, well, I live in Reed Springs, and I got some friends who live down here. He goes, you want a job? You want to work at the city? And I go, how do you know me? He goes, well, I, I saw your solo in the Tenth Theater. That was the best old man river I've ever seen in my life. I've heard. He goes, you want a singing job? And I go, no, 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 no singing jobs. He goes, well, what do you, what do, you do? I said, well, I graduated in photography. And uh, I said, I'm a pretty good photographer, but I really basically just know the chemistry of photography, how that works. And he goes, well, you need to be a tintype photographer. So he sent me down to Jim Jones, and Jim Jones gave me, not the Jim, the other, I got stories about that guy, but <laughs> this Jim Jones just worked at the Silver Dollar City, gave me a job. I worked there for a season doing the, you know, the process that uses the potassium cyanide, the old wet plate process. So we did that until we poisoned a bunch of people, <laughs> probably. I mean, I don't know if we poisoned them or not, but we had a spill that made cyanide jump out of the place. They ran us all up the hill, you know, but the vent was right by the train as it came by in the last run. So, you know, they called me the next day and said, well, do you know any way that we can have these thin types without killing everybody. And I go, yeah, you, you just go right Eastman and get some emulsion and you can, you know, prepare plates and that'll make us kind of a simulated tintype, right? And it worked, but I didn't want to work at Silver Dollar City very much longer because it, the, the pay was really pretty low. And so the next semester I came back to uh, work as a model for Susie Edinger in the drawing classes at the art department at SMS. The art department and the music departments were always much more welcoming, English too to some large extent, than any other department at MSU. <laughs> and you know, MSU's mission is to matriculate people who understand invidious racism. That's just what it's all about. It's sad, but it's true. Um, it's like, you know, what will be accepted and what won't be accepted regardless of where the line is, you know, or where the moral concerns are. And I think that's pretty much why all of the states in Missouri held fast to segregation until 54. It was to give all these white people a tremendous advantage over African Americans, even today these highways, these police, they don't profile stop because they're just trying to get the black man. They're trying to get the black man's money. <laughs> if he drives down the road in a Cadillac, and every now and then they'll bust somebody. But just like in Ferguson, it's been kind of a cash cow. And because the police are all white Republicans, they can get away with it, judges too. So. You know, if you understand that, just steer real clear of that part of the demographic, then you'll be okay. But what happened was, um, uh, I digress. Um, uh, I digressed from where? I'm trying to think now. I'm old, I'll be 66 next week. Okay, so no, I, I, I was there and I think that one of the, I was coming across from, Susie's drawing class, and I went into the college union, and there was a big spread, you know, gourmet food and stuff, you know, like a 
buffet, and there was one guy in there with a big cigar, and it was Gene Roddenberry, and he had come for a seminar, and there was no, uh, he had a, there was a press meeting, he was supposed to talk to the press before it happened, <clears throat> but they missed the appointment, all the press forgot it, so he was sitting in there by himself, smoking a big cigar, and I go, I walked around, and I saw him, I said, oh, you're Gene Roddenberry, he goes, you're the only one who knows that besides me, and I go, well, what are you doing here, he goes, oh, I'm supposed to be meeting the press, but they're not showing up. I said, can I talk to you? And he goes, yeah. So I talked to Gene Roddenberry for like three hours there. And we talked about everything. One of the things that he confided was he loved San Francisco. And he had been with Magel Barrett before he got on the plane and said to me, uh, Clarence. Because at first he asked me what my name was. I said, Clarence. He goes, hmm, that's a good name. I'm going to use that. I go, that's so uh, he goes, so. Uh, and so I told him that I'd been in a movie with Sun Ra, and he knew who Sun Ra was. Nobody here knew who Sun Ra was. And he's a jazz man, isn't he? And I go, yeah, he's a jazz man. So he goes, well, what about, uh, and he goes, San Francisco, yeah. He goes, that's my favorite city. He goes, you know that Safeway on the corner of uh, Market and uh, Church Street? And I go, yeah. He goes, you're, how many times have you been in there? And I go, yeah, about 100 times. I go, Pretty much. He goes, you know those doors that go shh, shh. I go, yeah, like on the set at uh, your, he goes, yeah. He goes, I had an epiphany just before I came here. I ran in here to get a razor and some gum or something before I got on the plane. And uh, those doors opened and it stunned me that everything that we saw in that series was going to come to be real. I said, that's pretty tall cotton. Everything, I said, what about the teleporters? He said, everything that we saw. He goes, I firmly believe that the science fiction writer today is the future seer of the future. That there are prophets. Our prophets are the science fiction writers of today. And I go, wow, that's, that's a really interesting take. And he goes, yeah, it is. And so we just sat there and we talked about it. So then he says, where, where are all the black people? And I go, what do you mean? He goes, well, I've been here for a day or so, and I haven't seen any, any black people. So I told him, you know, kind of what I had heard up to that point. After two years of anthropology, of this is my second year of anthropology, I know a little bit more about that story now, where it was put up like all of the African Americans were run out of Springfield in 1906. I found out that all the African Americans didn't live in Springfield in 1906. They lived in Willard and Pearl and uh, uh, Mount, uh, Walnut Grove and Hartville and down in Galloway because it was an agrarian time. And so when Easter came, Springfield was the hub of all these little agrarian towns where the fields that were cleared and everything. So people would come to celebrate Easter in Springfield at the Springfield churches. At that time, it'd be like Mount, Mount Eagle, uh, down, on, down on McDaniel Street. At that time, it was Minor Street. I think we talked about that. But, um, and there were, and the Washington Avenue and the, the, four, the four sisters, they call them. The, that'd be Gibson Chapel, Washington Avenue, uh, Pitts Chapel, and, um, the AME Church, the Reverend Brown went to. Oh, um, that was the, the, I don't even know what they called it then, but it was the African American Episcopal Church is what it was, corner of Central and Benton. Mm -hmm. So, um, um, what happened in 1906 was is that in 1900, 98% of all the people in the United States lived on the farm. In the year 2000, 100 years later, 98% of the people lived in the city. In 1950, half the people lived on the farm, half the people lived in the city. So you have this inverse squaring where all populations moved to the city. African Americans, the diaspora was part of it. The reasons for moving to the city from the rural places, the south, that 
those might have been different. You know, winching is a good motivator to go from one place to the other. But urban life was beginning to be more attractive than rural life. The way Springfield worked it is that it was just not welcoming to African Americans coming from Willard or Ash Grove. And it's sad because African Americans cleared pretty much all of this. Everything's cleared around here for farming was first done by African Americans. Boone's farm up there in Ash Grove, thousands of acres like that. Well, this was all done for slavery. You know, this, this was slavery. Slavery made that happen. The first clearing of the land. Then after the war was over with, the Civil War, um, this whole reconstruction thing started and by the time 1906 came lynching was a sport every town had that was just like something that they did when holiday came around and they'd get drunk enough to you know go get some negroes for some spurious reason and do him in that still goes on quite a bit and i think that's probably why there are still riots going on is because of the grim legacy. But um, in 1906, what happened is that everybody just went to the train station, got on the train and went back to their places that they lived, like I say, up in Hartville or over in, you know, Willard or Ash Grove, or, you know, out, actually out in Republic. There are a lot of really nice white people around here out in the rural areas. But this whole right-wing Republican thing that lives in Springfield, it won't let it happen for African-American people. It just will not do it. And you say that, of course, you know, that's like, you know, last act of defiance. But it's true. And uh, they know it's true. And in anthropology, Dr. Sobel said that it was competition for resources, but I think it's probably more than that. I think it's more, because we live in this, this is a crossroads culture. That was Dr. Clarence Ketch's take on the thing, is that Missouri is a crossroads culture. You have Highway 70, Highway uh, 66, you have you know now 44, you have 61 up from the, uh, right on the Mississippi River right through Missouri. You have 71 going all the way up north, 35 cuts across through Kansas City. It's a crossroads culture. So there should be enough for everybody. Missouri should never have a shortfall, but it always has a shortfall when it comes to African Americans. It never has any budget for that. So, you know, once you accept that's happening, then, you know, on it goes. Well, there were these people who were tenacious, who stayed in Springfield. Now, my family goes back to the McKinleys, the slave McKinley family. That would be 1831, 1832. So my family's been in the Ozarks, or in, in Greene County, since 1831. The Brewers and the Wilsons, that's on my father's side, uh, came up from northern Arkansas, just northwest Arkansas. He was a Dutchman named Brewer, and Wilson was a black woman from down around Little Rock who uh, was probably a former slave, because this is like 1883 or four. So she had three sons, and whenever, uh, she realized she would never be enfranchised. She moved her and her sons to Springfield. And they, two of them, began Teamster work between here and Tulsa because they were beginning to discover oil in Oklahoma. So uh, even though there was oil in Oklahoma, a lot of the infrastructure for developing oil was in Missouri. St. Louis and, you know, Kansas City and whatnot, foundries, machine parts, that kind of stuff. So they would drive all that, they would drive wagons of that down there. 
until trucking came along. This trucking really didn't take a turn upwards until after World War I because the technology was still bad. They were still using wagon technology to build trucks with and it just couldn't hold up. You know, you've seen those old trucks, they were horrible. So, uh, yeah, so then what happens is that they just didn't welcome any blacks. So blacks would go to St. Louis, Kansas City, Chicago, and like that. And that's why even today, you know, Springfield has an all-white police force. Maybe there may be one or two tokens. And, you know, they do their best to keep blacks out of teaching. You know, it's a, the media is pretty much all-white. And they operate around here, they being the conservative, dominant, hegemony out of some biblical show me ism which is they marginalize first everything you say and don't be articulate because then you'll get you get marginalized more than before but this kind of if you're a you know itinerant worker or you know you, you know, like a West Sider out here, somebody, and somebody comes to you and goes, well, the barometric pressure is going out, you show me. You know, you don't have to be very smart to be a show me guy, you know, but you can really slow down the process of disseminating information if you're, you know, a disciple of Doubting Thomas. You know him, right? Okay, so if you doubt first, if I doubt, with, well, no, no. Well, I can't believe that's a little old microphone. You show me how that thing works. Well, you're gonna spend time showing it. He's not gonna know anymore by the time it's over with. But that becomes the lead kind of thing, especially with African Americans, is that, you know, there's this doubt. And I think that we were talking before about real impediments. Well, John Jameson said that he had never been able to get one African American through vocational rehabilitation. I had my knees replaced back in 2001, I guess it was, right after I got back from Holland um, with my first record. That was weird how I got a record. Um, it's so strange. What had happened was that back when I was six years old, mom used to give us money to get our hair cut at Bub's Barbershop down on Tampa Street. And I would, she she give us 25 cents. So, you know, we and pay Bub, Charles Williams, before we had our hair cut. But we would have 25 cents to spend down in what was the equivalent of the neat rose center of business. You know, there was Graham's Barbecue and Charlie Fuller's Cafe and uh, a few other places, we'd go with Miss Cradles and get a bottle pop or something like that. But Charlie Fuller had a jukebox. And at six years of age, I could, one of the things you could do is play the jukebox. Hamburger was a nickel, Coca-Cola was a nickel. That would be, that would leave me like 15 cents to play songs. And so I memorized every tune on the jukebox. Well, in 1955, this is when that was, six years old, all the tunes were on 78 RPM records and they were from the 30s and the 40s. So they were blues records for the black clientele coming down from uh, Fort Leonard Wood and over from, you know, Fort was it? Over in Kansas, mm -hmm. you know, there was Fort Riley or something, I think it is. Or, Leavenworth? Uh, um, Leavenworth? No, no, wasn't that far up. It's just right here on the border, Nevada. There was a uh, Camp Crowder, they called it. And the black soldiers would come over. Well, there's prostitution upstairs and these greasy hamburgers downstairs and muddy waters on the jukebox. And in 78, John Hooker, you know, Howlin' Wolf. And so I memorized every tune, every, every, even the numbers, A7, you know, was, was, uh, was um, Dinah Washington. Uh, you know, I memorized it all because, you know, even though the church had music going on, those flying 
sisters, <laughs> you know, getting the spirit, really kind of distracted you from, you know, the technique of music. It wasn't the pure slice of, you know, blues music. So I listened to all that at six years of age. This is before I even got my first guitar. And I cataloged it someplace back in my memory. <clears throat> then a guitar student, this guy, Terry Hopper, said, uh, heard me playing the guitar in standard tuning once, and he goes, oh, what are you doing? And I said, oh, I'm trying to play a Muddy Waters song. He goes, well, you need to be in open tuning. I said, what's open tuning? He goes, oh, you know, Negro tuning. I go, Negro tuning? I go, what's that? And he goes, you know, slave tuning, uh, open tuning, blues tuning. And I said, you are making no sense. And he goes, well, here, tune your guitar like this. I said, who uses this tuning? He goes, oh, you know, Beatles, Johnny Mitchell, uh, you know, every step of all, everybody records and uses it. I said, well, I, I, why do they even teach this? And he goes, well, because this is the way you play guitars with these, with standard tuning. So I said, well, how do you play this? He goes, well, with this bottleneck slide. So I put the thing on there, and in 24 hours, every tune that I had memorized off of that jukebox, I was 42 at that time, came back. I had 50 tunes that I could play inside of 24 hours. And so I went back over to his place. How'd you learn all that? And I go, it was inside of me. I go, did you ever hear Stave and Jane? So I played a little Stave and Jane, you know, played a you know, little Walk in the Boogie and then some other stuff. And I just, it was, it was an epiphany. Um, then, you know, after four or five years playing that, I wound up with a resonator guitar, which was from the era. Learned a lot of Sunhouse songs. I already had those in me. And uh, because I could execute those songs flawlessly, because they had been registered as a child, uh, people began to listen. So I went down and played a blues show at, uh, uh, in Eureka Springs with Kelly Evans. She wanted to follow me on the blues road to see what it was like. So we got in the van and we went down there. I plugged up the amp. Started to play with me, fifteen hundred bucks in thirty minutes. I was playing, and she was getting the money and singing and dancing around, and we became real, really fast friends. Even to this very day, she's like just one of my best friends. Uh, and um, uh, I started a little Chitlin circuit of my own. I'd go from Eureka Springs um, over to West Plains. I go up towards St. Louis, but St. Louis, believe it or not, is kind of difficult for old time blues. And here's the story with old time blues music is that it harkens back to a time that anybody that remembers it remembers hard time. Jim Crow segregation, uh, desperate, abject poverty. I saw that most of the music pop music from the 60s was derived from blues of the 30s. A lot of these tunes came from the 1930s and so when I was about to sign my record contract with a high tone back in uh, the year 2000, I asked uh, Lou Whitney how that happened and he said well Black folks didn't have copyright working for them during that period, pretty much until the mid and late 1950s. So a lot of this music is what they call derivative. You know, you might have the same melody in 15 different lyric lines, but it's the same melody. And so people would just slap a new melody or slap a new lyric over the same melody line. But there were a lot of diverse melodies. There were a lot of different melodies, so it made a whole genre of music that the monkeys could ride on, you know, or, you know, the Rolling Stones or uh, Led Zeppelin. So they said, oh, well, we're going to make music like 
these old black folks will use their melody lines and we'll strap our lyrics on top of them. Sometimes they didn't even bother to change the lyrics. Sometimes they would just, you know, uh, do it. But their ethics were a little better than the ethics pre, um, you know, what did they call it? Um, payola. Pre payola. They, uh, their ethics were that, you know, when Skip James got cancer, um, Eric Clapton and Jack Bruce and the guys in Cream uh, raised money for him with his song, I'm So Glad, which was on their first record or something like that. So all these guys are making millions of dollars, millions of dollars in music. And the originators really didn't get much of anything. They were victims of that, that time. Springfield was a music center at, in my youth. When, I, when my dad went to work at Hickory Hills, a lot of the members really weren't very happy because it was a black man working there. But Mr. C Mr. Paul Reddick, he was a gem, he was a god of, of, of sorts, in that he hired African Americans to work at Hickory Hills Country Club. And I was just a little bitty spit at age 13 or 14. But I knew how to hook up the Bogan amplifier so that it wouldn't shock you. So when Carl, so when uh, uh, um, Cy Zetner and and uh, oh, uh, you know Benny Goodman and all these big bands would come to play at the country club, they'd go, "Hey, Clarence, to hook up the hook up the microphone so it won't shock you." So I would put the little ground wire on, it and it worked out great. Well. That's where I met Buddy Rich. He was down there in the basement, smoking a cigarette, looking for a drink. He says, what are you doing here, kid? And I go, I work here. And he goes, you do little work anywhere. Go down there to Hatton's room and get me a drink. And so I went and got him. Hatton knew what he wanted. Hatton Snell, he was the bartender down there. And uh, he said, you ain't food here? And I ran up and Joe Valdez, who has JJ's Trash Service now, made this really big steak dinner for Buddy Rich, you know, and I idolized Buddy Rich. I'd seen him on Johnny Carson and whatnot. So I took him his tray of food down there and stuff. So, you know, he's sitting there, you know, he's nursing his drink and the food is there. You know, he's looking at it a little bit, you know. So finally, he puts his cigarette out in the steak and he goes, listen, Clarence, I'm gonna tell you something. Don't be a musician. These guys, they, they just shot out this whole line of profanity. That was just like, a, you know, if I'd been, if I'd known, I'd wrote down some of those cuss words. But Buddy Rich was just, he was so mad at his band and I couldn't figure why is he so mad at I learned later when I tried to play with bands, musicians. So he's like, hey man, my wife said uh, I couldn't come practice. <laughs> that kind of stuff. Yeah. Uh, you know, I got to be in before 11 o'clock. My wife told me that this one o'clock gig stuff is not going to happen no more. I go, hey, go, you got two more hours. <laughs> you know, so, you know, all other stuff, you know, the drummer headed towards the bandstand with two big pitchers of beer after the break. <laughs> you know, you go, how does anybody drink that much beer? Not drinking saved me so much. I never drank. I never, never had to. It just made me feel like I was sick. So by the time it got to be 1958, Dr. Bill Francis wanted to experiment on me to see if he could graft bones from the leg into my feet that had a condition called metatarsicular pest planus. And it was from no folic acid in your diet during gestation. And so I wound up with this missing bone in my feet. Later on they found, well, we'll just give folic acid to the women. They won't have kids that are born without bones in their feet, or spinal bifida, or any number of other things, folic acid. And, but at that, that point he thought, well, we'll just do a, you know, early childhood surgery, a bone graft. Well, he was a Korean surgeon. He'd done that. And, uh, he, he, he figured out how to take a bone and fashion it in the operating theater and then insert it. And if you were still growing, it might take it. 
And it worked. It worked perfect. And I was one of the first 13 to have that kind of orthopedic surgery. Now, people had grafted bones in Holland back in the 1700s, late 1700s, but this guy who had part of his skull blown out, they got a monkey skull, put the bone to close his brain in. But then everybody ostracized him, said, you're not a man anymore, you're part animal. And so he didn't like that. But they didn't do it until, again, like 1958 or so. And so there were 13 of us. One of them died. One of the kids in the study died. But we were the first ones to have clinical bones grafted back in the late 1950s. Problematically, the bones, the place they took the bone from me was where my knee was supposed to anchor. And so this left knee just kept not staying where it needed to be. And finally, Bill took the knee cap completely off. And I went on with that until, like I say, the year 2000, and Dr. Richard Seagrave gave me two prosthetic knees, and I've been using those ever since. They work pretty good. But I didn't get any disability for any of that. And uh, so now what happens is that uh, I'm over at Lou Whitney's studio about to sign a record contract and Eric Gamble comes in and goes, wow, record contract, high tone, that's a good label. I said, yeah, but Larry Slogan said he wasn't gonna give me any money. Larry's this guy was running high tone then. I said, that, well, he calls me up, hello, Dave Alvin told me to call you. And I go, well, yeah, well, what's up? And he goes, well, he seems like you're pretty good. And since he sells a lot of records around here, we have to do what he says. And he goes, you ever sign a record contract? I go, no. And he goes, and I said, well, what do I get? And he goes, well, you don't get any money. <laughs> I go, what? <laughs> yeah, but your name will be a household word in maybe five or six years from now. You know, one of your songs will come on, catch on if you're good. And I go, well, okay. So we did, you know, we just recorded King Clarence. King Clarence. I had the cast on my leg when I was 10, 9 or 10, I guess it was. And it was hot, it was summertime, I was sitting around. And mom came in and she said, you do not think that you're going to be sitting around like little King Clarence and not do any homework or do these dishes or housework. I go, little King Clarence, hmm, that guy, that's who I want to be. So later on, somebody said, well, you know, you're kind of like B.B. King or Prince or somebody. I said, I'm a king, King Clarence, and it stuck. So then everybody just started calling me King, King, you know, which is what they call, you know, the linos and everything else. But, you know, you, if you're a blues guy, you got to have a blues moniker, you know, right? So I'm King Clarence. We pulled up to the American Music Festival in Chicago. A bunch of reporters ran up to the door and said, John Hooker died. You've got more hook than Hooker, and you're the new king of boogie. What do you got to say? I go, no comment. <laughs> and, uh, it was so funny. You know, and I did but it was sad because John John Lee had died. But I thought that that was funny. I was going up there with the skeletons, it's a local band. As I fell in with the artist, back in college, I began to see that they were a lot more accepting of diversity. People of color, women, everything it was, it was a different world where, you know, uh, the conservative things that were going on, I just couldn't participate. Can't, you know, there's just so many ways to not participate in Springfield along you know, Route 66, but I've just been so blessed by the few people who came along and they didn't really have race as a denominator. That wasn't what they were looking at. They were looking at this wonderful sort of humanity and this melting pot thing that goes on. And of course, you know, at a crossroads, you're going to have people who dominate industry and dominate society, politics, business, religion. And it is in many ways very, very sad the way that, like I say, invidious racism is matriculated out of MSU. They don't even know, I think, that they're doing it anymore. I think that it gets, gets to be something that if there's 
a problem, most of the time, people fall back to the way they used to do things. Well, that can be really bad if the way they used to do things were a lot worse than taking a step forward into a new thing. And when equity in the races gets to be the new thing, and you have these hidebound conservatives who are thinking, well, that's going to divide the market away from us. We'll lose money if we have to hire them. We have been so dependent on people coming from the outside to run businesses in Springfield who um, have equitable feelings in their heart that the persons who were native here were kind of last step Charlie to catch up. Local businesses, you know, had to be shown by the national businesses it's okay to hire a black guy. It's okay to hire a black woman. That, you know, people just by their skin color are not by their very nature evil. So I've watched the police, you know, uh, harm individuals, Cluster Clark, you know, Michael Dunlap, um, you know, just over and there's one guy was shot over here on Commercial Street, a Hispanic guy. But you never hear, that was like, what, a month ago. Another guy was shot on a porch over here. Uh, I guess it was like Grant and um, Nichols. Well, about three months ago. You never, nobody's gonna march for that. You know, that's, nobody's gonna say anything. It was in the news cycle for, I think one day or two days, both of those murders. The one guy over on Commercial Street was shot in the back three times by a guy who had quit the police department two weeks before. You know, so he was just riding along with his friends and when the guy saw the police and started running, I think he was Hispanic and he shot him and he's, you know, but nothing, the, there's this thing, I think it's called buddy justice where, you know, the judges and the police and the lawyers, you know, whenever I got in a struggle about my dad beneficiary deeded my five acre farm out west. Well, the only lawyer that I could get said, all right, I want 45% of your sale to take your case if you win. And, or you can put a big sculpture in my backyard here. I said, well, what do you want, Bob? And he goes, a giant pig. <laughs> and I go, okay, 45% of the sale, Giant pig, giant pig it is. So it's over there. If you go to McDonald's over on McDaniel and National, Bob Sweeters right across, and you look in his backyard, there's Old Major, the pig from Animal Farm, I think it is, that story. He liked that. So I made it. I made a lot of sculpture. I put this Crescent in front of the Crescent Hotel. I put all the mules around the Mel Tilla show. I have a mule up at the Pipestone National Park pulling a 20-ton stone of pipe zone, granite. Um, I had a show in uh, Utrecht, Holland. I, um, they got a hold of all of my art prints and had a show. Um, let's see, I've shown in the Springfield Art Museum, uh, Drury College more than once. In the 90s, I had the largest attended opening of any art exhibit at the Liddy Gallery over there. Um, I've sold hundreds of sculptures that I've, you know, made from steel. And uh, all of that really took pretty much a back burner. It was really hard to play music and be a sculptor as my parents went into decline because of any number of reasons. I know that my siblings have a profound hatred of Southwest Missouri just because of invidious racism. And, you know, I try to say, well, everybody's not like that. They go, yeah, but if you're looking for prosperity, you're not going to find it in Springfield, Missouri, because that is a closed market, especially if you're an African American. Well, not only is it a closed market, 
it's a pretty closed culture because, you know, white people have their culture and black people have their culture. There's some, there's some amalgamation. There's some, you know, thawing. But because the political ethic is still so 1948, it doesn't allow the social ethic to exist where, you know, I mean, I've made a lot more money playing guitar in Kansas City than I have in Springfield. And the only really big gig I ever played in St. Louis was the Big Muddy Festival where I opened for Link Ray. <laughs> it was so funny. That guy, that the first tune I learned, uh, I was in front of, and he was an old guy by then, had a couple of girls in some ballroom gowns playing bass and drums. <laughs> But um, that was that was interesting. I think that there there is an upside to this, and what it is is that whenever you have to live in a place that is so extreme in one dimension, it makes you a lot better able to spot adversities in the greater world. <clears throat> it's like adversity builds strength, you know. Well, had it not been for Mr. Otis Letterman, who saw that I was an artist with a welding torch and took me to the University of Missouri in Columbia, where I won, I couldn't win a scholarship because I didn't have, um, you know, college prep courses. I'd just taken welding. But I was sort of articulate and I could pick up quick. And he said, oh, you'll be great in college. So there's one day between high school and college for me. And then I found that at SMS in the year 1967, there were still some 20-year professors, 30-year people had been over there for 20 or 30 years. And they were really not happy that the school had integrated. Mm -hmm. My sister, Helen, was the first African-American to graduate from MSU, SMS at that time. And she had a very difficult time, and it had not been for Mr. Peace, uh, she probably, Bob Peace, she probably wouldn't have done it because every other instructor, every other department was not welcoming. And that's probably why I graduated with an art degree because there was a department of liberal thinking, liberal artists, you know. if. MSU could embrace liberal and arts, it would be a great liberal arts school, but it doesn't embrace that. And I just watched too many potentially really good things go south because of those, those attitudes. It takes a lot out of you to do geriatric care. I never, if I'd known, I don't know if I would have decided to, it's like what people say about having children. If I knew how hard it was to be a parent, I would have thought twice about it. Well, if I'd known how hard it was to take care of your mama and dad, you know, until their death, uh, I, I really don't know if I would have decided to do that, but I loved them so much that I couldn't, I, I just, they, you know, steadied me through the worst times of a human life, you know, and I, I, loved him for it but dad died and most of his trucking cu customers he was the oldest trucker in Springfield in the city limits when he died and I've been driving his truck for 30 years now since I got back from California he died and all of his customers died right after that one right after the other now I'm down to one customer and they're just the best in the world they have just seen us as a family go through the whole thing down at temperature control. This Gary Smith, he's a sweetheart. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, I get the scrap metal for income and uh, every now and then I'll get a little gig. Dr. Sobel has helped me quite a bit. I think the most she's helped me with, we've gone on digs up to McKinley Plantation and we've 
pretty much figured out that all of these families, black families in Springfield are related because they all lived in these farming communities around Springfield. And one after the other, welcoming or not, they migrated into Springfield. The Johnsons, the Richardsons, the Fergusons, the Rollins, the Ingrams, all of us are the Beatles. You know, they, we, you, you just go down the list, you can, it's a family tree of persons that are small enough to do anthropological studies. The connections, the connectivity. So, that's what we do is that, you know, I've helped her. She's called me a research assistant, but that's only because I can remember where everything was at. You know, so. Is it over? Yeah, <laughs> I think we probably need to wrap it up. I think uh, the, uh, I, I don't know if you're using tape or? We're using a digital card. Digital card, yeah, okay, yeah. yeah. I, I had a lot of, I had a lot of jobs. Well, I, I know that you, did. I know that you mentioned uh, some of the businesses on Route 66, and, uh, and I know that you told me that you grew up in a house right around the corner from it. Any memories that you have about the, the famous road uh, in or traveling to any of the areas that uh, that you visited, maybe working or as a musician? I uh, um, had a job, oh God, oh my Lord. How many jobs on Route 66? First of all, Mr. Saltzman sold my step-grandfather the house that I live in now it was on the corner of National and St. Louis Street, and at that time, St. Louis Street in 1930 was the um, was Highway 66. That was Route 66, right into the public square, and it was all in the paper that that Mr. Woodruff was the chief planner of Route 66. Well, uh, here's a good one. Um, uh, Daddy Kelly bought that house and moved it down there on, uh, you know, house movers. Bought it for a dollar from Mr. Saltzman because he saw the commercial potential of having the highway go right in front of, you know, his property. He had a little store, Saltzman's Grocery Store on Kickapoo and, and uh, St. Louis Street, and he owned all of that parking lot and uh, where Price Cutter is now. Well, um, during that time, you know, 1930, there was a lot of racism in the world. That was like the heyday of Jim Crow. Jewish people really threw in to help African Americans. That's where Lincoln School came from. A bunch of Jewish merchants built schools for African Americans all across the United States because they realized that you can't have, you know, a, a demography that is completely behind everybody else. It's just going to pull everybody else down. Something that the rest of the world and the rest of this country hasn't really realized. And sadly, it's not realized in Israel or Palestine. You can't keep a, you know, bunch of people in as much as, you know, apartheid and subjugate it right next door and it not pull you down. I think Harry Truman said about the Klan when he was in the cell. He said, um, one thing about the Klan is that uh, if you see two people in the gutter and one's got the other uh, on another one's neck, the one thing is true is that both of them are in the gutter. And he goes, and the other thing is, is that you guys are paying nine ninety five for a two dollar sheet. So I might point that out. So I don't know. He made a lot of fans as a Democrat, but um, the. Truth is, is that a lot of people haven't come to the altar on racism around here. But as far as my work up and down St. Louis Street or Highway 66, I've played from Carthage to St. Louis, up and down uh, the highway. My brother-in-law for a short time, Helen, the one that graduated first from SMS, his name was McDowell, and, I, and he told me this story once that his uncle was Mississippi Fred McDowell, the blues man. We were going to, to Lebanon where he lived and his dad, Henry, was 
uh, from down around Senatobia, Mississippi. So I'm down around Senatobia, Mississippi, and I go to Fred McDowell's grave because I met a woman who was living in the house that he lived in before he died. Well, it turns out that he had shot a man, Henry, Fred's brother, and back then, if they couldn't catch the culprit, they just killed the brother, you know, because they or the whole family if they thought that they were, you know, could get away with it. Well, Henry went up to Rock Island, Illinois, to try on Highway 61 to escape the lynch mob because the guy that he shot was a town bully. He'd been responsible for a couple murders, and you know, and if you were black and fishing, and you know, you had a big catch, well, he would get it. Well, Henry had decided that he wasn't going to get his catch and reached in and got a gun and said, if you come get my fish, I'll shoot you. So he goes, we're going to get your fish and we might kill you too. And so he just shot him. It was you know, a hard time. So he got up here. Well, Mr. Woodruff, the same Woodruff, got, saw Henry Yandy dancing on the Rock Island line and said, you are the hardest working. And he was calling cadence to them. You know, again, you answer, you know, the rail guys. So he says, I need you to work on this highway for me. We're going to put a highway across this country. And we're under our orders from President Roosevelt. Well, there are like 150 blues songs about Roosevelt. And everybody, the black folks just loved President Roosevelt because it was the first glimmer of, of equity. So he went down and he was working on the highway up near Lebanon. And uh, so these sh sheriffs from down in Senatobia County, it's like Como, Mississippi, it's like 30 miles south of Memphis. Okay, they came up and they tracked him down. They went to the Mr. Woodruff who was sitting there with the plans of the road up near Lebanon and said, we want him, he murdered a man down in Mississippi and we've been looking for him. And Mr. Woodruff said, I am under orders from the President of the United States to put this road through. We're working from Chicago to Springfield, from Tulsa to Springfield, and from Tulsa West to Los Angeles. This man is the best road worker I have. And unless you have the authority to dismiss a pardon, from the President of the United States, I would say that you do not have a chance to get him off of this crew right now. So they thought about it for a little while. They figured they'd been trumped by President Roosevelt, who had already bought a mule for a guy down in Mississippi. That's another story. But he, uh, they left, and so Woodruff went to, to Henry McDowell and said, Henry, is that true? And he goes, yep, I shot him dead. And so he goes, well, I'm, I need you. So this is what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna send you into Lebanon and I want you to go over there and talk to Miss, Mr. Moneymaker and he will give you a house over on McPhail Street to live in. He goes, are you married? He goes, yeah, I just got married. Uh, and he goes, well, your family is going to be all right. You do not have to worry about that charge anymore. I'm going to have that dismissed. And so Henry McDowell and his crew made Highway 66 from Lebanon to Springfield. They laid the first stretch of Highway 66 from Springfield to, and most of this, and he did some down towards uh, uh, Joplin. Now, early on, the road went towards Carthage, but then it moved out and went down to Joplin, and that part of the road was 96 Highway that goes straight out to Kansas. So it's, the road used to go to Carthage. So in my own experiences, I played for Lowell Davis, who's got a little place down there off of old 66. He's a sculptor played for his birthday. Um, I've played up and down this highway, me and so many places. Um, but lately I've been going to West Plains, West Plains. And this year I'm headlining the Jazz Festival at 
Jefferson City. It's called the Capital City Jazz Fest. It's September the 15th, and they say that they always get a real big turnout for blues, and antique blues is really a draw because most of my peers are dying. They are. Most of the old blues guys are gone. And I'm like one of the few left. And I feel kind of sick. <laughs> that just kidding. <laughs> well, Clarence, if you're open to it, we would you consider doing maybe a second interview? Because you've got tons of memories, and they're they're so detailed. Uh, we, Another one, yeah. Yeah, we sure. Like, okay. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I, I've covered. I mean, you cover your life. Yeah. But yeah. I bet you've got even more information if we just focused on Route 66, because we got now your background. Yeah. Covered really well. Uh, well, you better make a place on that cutting room floor. <laughs> hey, no, we're, not no, we're, we're that Woodruff. The whole thing was, awesome. yeah, that's, that's great information. Yeah. yeah, Henry McDowell. He was the one. Uh, he oh. was the head. He was the guy who was the the boss, mm -hmm. the crew boss from from Lebanon to Springfield. Mm -hmm. And Sam told me the story. Mm -hmm. But what happened was, is I fell in with a little blind woman down in Como, Mississippi. And this, this is how the linchpin of the story works. Is she had gone macular de degeneration, and uh, she was a sculptor. She is a sculptor, and she's responsible. Her name is uh, Sharon McConnell, and she's responsible for all of the mask, life mask of all of the blues artists from the 19th. 30s to the 1990s. That was her work, is to get these artists and then take a, a casting of their masks. She lives in a house that was formerly owned by Miss Kate Swango. And Katie Swango, after Henry shot the guy and took off, they rode down on, on Mississippi Fred and said, oh, we're going to kill you. Well, Katie Swango was a mountain of a woman. She got on her horse with a bullwhip and a gun and rode down on the mob as they were about to burn out Fred McDowell. And she said, now you all know he's the best guitar player in this whole town and y'all want to kill him because of something his brother did? First thing is, is that good riddance for whatever Henry did, because you know that he was just the sweetest butter, and you all are wanting to kill him, and him, and then she said, get out of the way, pow. She cracked the whip on him and shot at a couple of them, and they cleared out, and so she said, Fred, you come out. You are going to live with me for the rest of your life. And so she brought Fred McDowell into her house uh, down there in Como to live, and she said, I will protect you from these people. And so then when Fred died, she buried him in the Black Cemetery. Very shortly after that, Katie's niece, a, a, a lady named, um, oh, she was an actress, and her name was Tallulah Bankhead. Is that right? Tallulah Bankhead, that was her name. And she'd been in a movie called Lifeboat with, guy named Clark Gable and she was really famous for that but um, Tallulah had a problem she couldn't have things touch her skin so she wound up in her later years just being naked not wearing clothes at all and the only thing she could wear is like a feather boa that she'd wrap around her neck and then onto her and so Katie said, you know, so she'd be out there walking around nude in Como. And uh, um, Katie said, you can do anything you want because I run this town. And so um, that, then the, when Katie died and Tallulah died, the house sat vacant. And then the next thing you know, Sharon got that place. And so I went in there, and so she told me the story about, about Fred. And I said, well, do you know what happened to Henry? And they go, no, we never knew what happened to Henry. I said, well, he moved up to Missouri, and he was the guy who was the road crew boss 
for the road from from uh, Lebanon to Springfield. And back during those times, you know, there wasn't like a whole bunch of white folks that would work on anything that hard. I mean, you know, they got my grandpa to dig for Campbell and Jarrett and the federal penitentiary. I played in all three, but not as an inmate. <laughs> <laughs> so, that's that. No, yes, right. I'll come back. We'll okay. Very good. Thank you so much. <laughs>